My next guest has written powerful pieces that have been read widely after being endorsed and shared by the likes of J.K. Rowling. He's a member of the LGBT community, or is he? As a gay man, Ben Apple has warned of the erasure of men like him in the pursuit of gender-affirming care. In a series of groundbreaking articles for publications like Spiked Online and the Daily Mail, and now Ben is creating waves again for an interview with a gender clinic whistleblower, Tamara Piezzi, in which the true problems of gender medicine are exposed. Ben joins me now. Ben, thank you so much for your time. Your interview and, and your previous articles all touch on the logical fallacies and excesses of the so-called uh, trans movement, the gender-affirming care model. Uh, tell me about this backward notion that's embraced there about gender norms. Uh, if you don't subscribe to uh, a particularly feminine trait, then you can't be a girl. If you've got masculine traits, then you must be a boy and, and vice versa. It's really quite backward. Uh, we've, we're supposed to be beyond that, but now we've gone back to these gender norms and a little boy liking pink and ballet may be in the wrong body. Yeah, I mean, it's really troublesome. And, you know, the thing is, is that, a lot of activists and even clinicians and and folks that are working in these spaces are really combining the the transgender with gender nonconforming. So they say like TGNC. So it's all just kind of collides into one category. And in reality, there's you know uh, uh, so many different factors that go into why someone might one be gender nonconforming, but two might happen to identify or want to identify as the opposite sex it's it's such a complex thing that that activists and clinicians are really trying to dumb down and simplify into something really easy mm. and a lot of people are being harmed um in the process but like you said now the fact that we're specifically medicalizing gender non-conforming kids who would otherwise grow up to be gay or lesbian or not but the majority of them probably would yeah. grow up to be gay or lesbian if they were just left alone. It is really a new form of conversion therapy um, that's really that's mm. really troubling, and I'm glad that you're talking about it. Well, the, the whistleblower you spoke to highlights uh, several cases, and one of those cases she treated at this gender clinic, multi-care. The patient was a 13-year-old girl, had an abusive mum, had sexual assault history, uh, terrible case, uh, had all sorts of uh, mental health issues like depression, PTSD, anxiety. She, she was on the spectrum. She had autism. And yet she was very quickly diagnosed with gender dysphoria and your whistleblower was told she should be on medication to stop her um, menstruating and, and given drugs like testosterone, really powerful drugs. She opposed this and the child was removed from her care. I, I do wonder just how widespread this issue is, how, much, how many of these gender-confused kids have got all sorts of other mental health issues or traumas in their past and they're getting this diagnosis uh, that is supposed to be the answer to all their prayers. I mean, we know that it is pretty widespread. I mean, the numbers have dramatically increased in recent years, especially since about 2013 or 2014. The the numbers of young people identifying as trans and, and going to gender clinic has, has, has skyrocketed. However, the amount of gender clinics has also skyrocketed. So, uh, you know, it, it, there we went from one to well over 100 in about, uh, I don't know, 15 years. So um, now, obviously, they're being reversed and some of them are being shut down in the U.S. Um, after legislation is closing them down. Um, but it is a widespread thing. And there are a lot of other factors that go into why someone would want to identify out of their sex, especially for young girls. Um, you know, a lot of young girls are identifying as trans in clusters. The social contagion is a big part of it. And there have been studies about this, and as much as activists like to debunk this idea, it is, a, in fact, a statistical reality that that there are clusters of, of young girls identifying out of their sex. And, you know, some people attribute that to social contagion. Another thing that can be 
um, autism spectrum disorder, like you said, uh, you know, autistic people tend to see things in very black and white. So if they have teachers and guidance counselors telling them that, you know, if you like pink and you like this, you might not be a male on the end, you know, you might not be a male on the inside, you might be a girl on the inside or vice versa. You know, if you like rough and tumble things in sports, you might not be a girl, you might be a boy. And then others, you know, girls just uh, as they grow older and start to mature, they're start to be sexualized and they start to be, you know, and they really want to uh, hide from that and disguise themselves. Um, a lot of times trans identity and identifying as a boy for young girls can be kind of, they're hiding out in this identity um, to, mm. to prevent that kind of sexualization. Well, puberty is an awkward period, really, just for about everybody. It's not an easy few years. And to add this gender confusion to the mix and provide all these so-called solutions, uh, I can understand why there's so many kids who, who who are confused and we have so many cases now of these detransitioners, people who have gone down this uh, path, have had medical treatment, some have even had irreversible surgeries, and very quickly, Ben, they've discovered this isn't the answer, this isn't making them happy, in fact, it's making them more depressed and they detransition and go back to, to the sex they were born. How prevalent is that movement becoming? Because I've, I've spoken to a couple on this program, but they have faced such hatred and such vitriol from so many in the trans community that I can understand why many others would be scared off talking because who wants to face that after everything they've been through to then be labelled a bigot and a hater and a self-loather and all sorts of other slurs, uh, you can understand why many of them stay silent. Absolutely. You, you know, uh, there are folks that say, you know, once you're trans, once you say you're not trans, like you can't say you're not trans once you're trans. You're you're out and you're you're mm. um, you know, really excommunicated from that from that community. Um, there are a lot of detransitioners. I know many that initially started to speak out a little bit and then actually pulled back when they saw the kind of blowback that they were getting and how much of a toll it was taking on their mental health and just their lives in general. You know, for me personally, like I know tr trans adults who are happy with their decision to transition. And I know a lot of trans adults who are unhappy. And what really changed mm. my perspective a lot, besides learning about the history of trans medicine, which is that you know speaking of adolescent transition i mean initially all of the the first young cohort about 60 i think it's 61 or 62 out of the 70 uh young people between 2001 and 2008 in amsterdam in the netherlands and amsterdam where this practice really started 62 were homosexual um so it is really mm -hmm. about medicalizing kids who are same-sex attracted Gender nonconformity is super common in childhood, especially for people who grow up to be gay and lesbian. And all cohort studies show, all studies have shown, there's about 11 to date that show that the majority of kids, maybe between like 60 and 90%, sometimes higher, but sometimes maybe 85, end up desisting. They stop experiencing what's called gender dysphoria or what used to be called gender identity disorder. If they're allowed to proceed through puberty, they grow up and they become more comfortable in their bodies because they realize that oh I'm just yeah. a, I'm different and that's okay. I'm just a gay person or I'm a, I'm a, you know I'm a lesbian and and I can live and thrive. We should not be turning gay people into facsimiles of straight people or you know uh mm -hmm. trying to 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 do this kind of conversion therapy. But what really changed things for me was talking to these detransition gay people specifically, detransition gay men and I'm, you know, working on something now, writing about that, um, and just hearing their stories about they've gotten irreversible surgeries, they've had the bottom surgeries, a number of them, and they have severe health complications from mm. these surgeries. And so this is yeah. mistreatment, this is maltreatment, and this should be, this is a liberal issue that people should be aware of, and, and we shouldn't be medicalizing homosexuality, and we shouldn't be harming people that that shouldn't be Harm. There's a lot of other issues that go into this and they're making it a one-size-fits-all sort of thing. 
Absolutely, and we, we saw that with the revelations from the WPATH files, the World Professional Association for Transgender Health. Uh, just shows how little science is really behind this ideology and movement. And you mentioned there some of the consequences of, of these surgeries, people losing sexual function, people becoming sterile and, and making those decisions when they're very young and not really understanding the full impact. Uh, you're doing amazing work, Ben. We look forward to your new book and thank you so much for your time tonight. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it.